Alex or Alexander? Well, either is fine. Okay. I'll probably use Alex just to save some time. <laughs> um, one of the hardest things in playing the piano, well, the two most depressing things about playing the piano is number one, every note that we play dies. You know, as soon as we play it, it's dying. That's pretty depressing. The second most depressing thing about playing the piano is every stroke that we make is a down stroke. Um, I, I think one of the things that I find most inspired and inspiring about dealing with this music in particular is the idea of letting go of the keyboard or of tr trying to create a, a sense of an up bow, you know, to, to, if, if we had some sort of lift. And, and the idea of an up bow is, is a really great thing on, on a string instrument. You know, usually though, when, when violinists make an up bow, it's usually they make a nasty crescendo on the fifth. It's not this lofty thing of lifting the note up. It's usually just the opposite of what we want. But we can actually do that. And, and, and part, of the, part of the hardest part about getting out of that downward motion is the fact that, I mean, every, every motion we make is a down stroke. We, we press the notes down, you know? We, we, we talk a lot about you know lifting the sound out of the piano, and, and, and that's, that's, that's something to be said. But I, I found that uh, right away in book one, there were many, many lessons to be learned as far as uh, making some textures lighter than others. Um, uh, for instance, even just, the, even just the repeated pattern in the beginning of the C major break. Why would he, why would he do it twice the same way? I think he would probably want to do the second one as an echo. And if we couldn't, we, we could make that second time a little bit shorter, uh, but the, other, the only other way we could make it sound like an echo uh, on the harpsichord would be uh, if we actually uh, made it a little bit slower as it would be coming back from the canyon, you know? Um, and then the next, the next problem we have is that it happens twice in a measure. So one of, those is, one of those is basically the first half of the bar is kind of a, down, a, a downbeat feeling. The second one is an upbeat feeling. So how, so how, do, we make, how do we cultivate that? And I do that in the opposite. So the second one is, is the opposite articulation. But so, so Changing, changing the variety is, is one thing, and immediately that goes into the, the C minor, which, which we often play. And I, I like to think of uh, one half, one quarter of the beat, or one quarter of the measure as a, a down, a down beat, and, and the opposite as a kind of a lighter one. I think one of the least, uh, least uh, often used uh, markings in music, and we should use it more, is the parentheses. I think there are, there are some places where we should have parentheses, for instance, around, around the left hand in the beginning of this piece. So, so I'm really laying into it, but the left hand is... And then I immediately change it. to not wanting to do the same thing over and over again. And I think, I think Bach would appreciate that. Then the next lesson he gives us is in the D major prelude. And that's where he starts teaching us how to let go. He does that one. actually gives you a rest. There, where does it go? We can't make it a downstroke if, if the gesture is We really have to lift it up. We have to really just lift our hand off the keyboard. Another thing that we can do is, and, and it's very visually hard to deal with because we often see these four sixteenth note patterns 
But I like I like to really go from two to one. So and now this is it's a release. Because we never want to give we never want to hear it like going in on itself. And that's something that even string players have a hard time doing. But to, to really go two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. It happens in all of the preludes. So rather than, you know. And now here. This is the first one that actually goes so The, the next uh, most important thing that I learned from the kids on From the Top. Did you, anybody hear the radio show that I used to do called From the Top? The kids would come and play uh, on national radio, and we would, let's say, there'd be a violinist playing their Vinyovsky piece, you know, for a violin and orchestra, and it would be furious, you know, furious playing. And, and uh, we'd get to the cadenza, and then they'd be off and running off to the races, and they'd continue to, to be, at, you know, at this furious pace, despite the fact that there were twice, and, twice as many octaves and leaps as there had been in the regular part of the piece. And what I told them was, take into account the fact that you are suddenly not coordinating with an orchestra or an accompaniment, and this is the composer telling you that you are the momentary master of space and time. That it is all up to you. There's no metronome to, to coordinate with, there's no conductor, there's no accompanist, there's nothing. It's all up to you to create the sense of timelessness as well as time. Uh, I, I don't know whether you guys have, uh, I, I went to see S. Becca Salomon conduct the LA Philharmonic yesterday, and it was just a, a, an extremely important lesson in how, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing, you know, conductors doing the beat pattern, they're describing the beat, but Salomon was, you know, there would be one, and then there would be two, and then three, with, for each one of these had a fluid gesture that was either more expansive or less expansive than the beat before it. So he was not just keeping time, he was creating time. And so when we sit at the piano, you know, so I, so I started taking my own best advice from the top, because when I said to these, these kids, you are the momentary master of space and time in those cadenza moments, I would go into a Beethoven concerto, you know, and there is no more kinetically driven composer than Beethoven. It's all about the beat, you know, almost all the time. But there would be places in a Beethoven concerto that I would be unaccompanied by the orchestra, not just in the cadenza, but I would be all by myself, and I, I took my own best advice and said, okay, well, I'm creating the time here. And so, and so think of it, solo piano music. Who, who are we responsible for? What train do we have to catch? We are creating the time ourselves. And so um, it's not about keeping the beat, but we do want to have a sense of um, how we're actually uh, interacting with each voice. So for instance, I can make that 16th rest. I mean, it would be very easy to just play it in time. idea of, of, the, of the right hand being a response to the left hand. And so maybe the 16th rest is going to be longer the second time. And maybe it's going to be even longer the third time. That's your choice. That's absolutely your choice. I keep wishing that we could make scores, we could print scores, so that maybe the 16th rest would be sort of pint-sized the first time, and maybe a little bit more with its elbows sticking out the second time, and the third time, which is just like getting in the way, but it would, again, give us this sense of the variability and the freedom inherent in, in the printed score. There is nothing saying that the notes have to follow in exactly metronome time. There's no metronome accompanying our performances. There is no metronome, there was no metronome uh, for S. Beck Salomon last night. He was creating the time as he went along based on the needs of the music in front of him. So here, I, 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 I find that each one of these entrances gives us a, a nice way of, of taking an actual breath. 
and, and also gives us a sense of, of, of that breathlessness, of that, of that being aloft. Can you try that a little bit? And so, but, but the most important thing, Alexander, I'm going to ask you to just play that first half measure. And I just want, I want to see your hand float off into the air at the end of that half measure, OK? I want to see it leave the keyboard. Actually, you, you plant. You still planted it. I want. I want you to. I want you. I want it to be this kind of gesture. Not. But just lift it off. Lift it off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's, that's quite what, quite lovely, isn't it? It's really got a kind of a nice malleability to the sound. But I think every one of those entrances, you can take a little bit of a breath. It's like you're conducting two different sections of an orchestra. There will there will be a natural inclination. There will be a natural bowing to each. And because we're playing it all with two hands, it's very easy to, to coordinate. But I think it's much better to be able to project to the audience that feeling of a real honest reaction, interaction between the voices. Can you try that? Because but that, but that was really lovely. How did that feel? Just like your hands leaving. It's scary, isn't it? <coughs> it's really scary. But it's something that I think we need to cultivate. Try that one more time. That was really wonderful. Here, those notes can have parentheses in these. Maybe not those, but these. Though again, because we never want to have that feeling. We want to have that continuousness. It's almost like a like a like a police siren. You know, we we, we don't we don't want it in our face. We want to have that constant breath that sense of intake and outtake. I just want to uh, just uh, make one more suggestion about the fugue, which is this, uh, this idea that, and this is unique in, um, in the whole Welch of the is that striving upwards, that going to the ninth of the going. kind of sense of, of upward upward motion. And the other thing that I, I want you I want you to take into account is the opportunity to use the trills. He marks it once, but I think you know one one way to do it. and I want you to do it more, is the idea of differentiating those voices. It's almost like two violists who, whenever they have something in tandem, like sixths or thirds, they all like wink at each other, and you know, oh, that's great, we're playing together. But we want to have the distinction between the voices. Or, so you can decide to make either the lower voice, or the upper voice. Legato and the other one short. That's always whenever you have whenever you have two voices. You, you can see here I've I've marked the lower voice legato. So those are choices that I think we really need to make if we're moving in thirds or sixths. It's a choice. We really have to decide 
which one of those we want to be the prominent one, which ones you want to be the long, the last voice singing, okay? That always is a choice you need to make. And, and try, you've got a great technique. You, I just, I, I, put, put in all those trills whenever you possibly can, because that's, that's one of the things that makes this feud really so exciting. This is, in fact, Alexander, this is the B minor. The, the, B, the B minor is the ending of book one, but this is the finale of book one. So it really needs to have that kind of exuberance, that kind of hallelujah feel about it. Okay, great job, my friend. Thank you very much.